and welcome to the Book Club Review, the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. As a reader, what would be your perfect cookbook? You'd want delicious recipes, right? But how great would it be if you also got a wealth of literary references to inspire your next read? Listeners, I may have just the books for you. With her little library series of cookbooks, Kate Young has carved out a particular niche intertwining her love of food with the books that have inspired her and shaped her life. And so, you might find a recipe for French toast, inspired by Maria Semple's comic novel, Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Or Lemon Verbena Lemonade, to accompany the perfect picnic, inspired by Charles Ryder and Sebastian Flight, lounging on the lawn together in Brideshead Revisited. These are cookbooks with two indexes, one of things to eat, the other of things to read. In this interview, Kate and I spoke about lockdown cuisine, book recommendations, and the difficulties of finding the right book club. But first, we talked about the treacle tart that was where it all began. I started a blog in 2014, along with, I would say, quite a few people. I was actually quite late to the blogging party. At that point, I was working as a producer in theatre and was just looking for a little creative outlet to do some writing to do something that was just mine, to make some work that felt fun and interesting and that had a bit of a hook that meant that there was always something I could go back and rediscover the next week. And I essentially made a treacle tart from Harry Potter. That was the first inspiration and the first kickstarting moment was going, Harry Potter loves treacle tart when he went to Hogwarts. I had never eaten it. I grew up in Australia. We don't really have treacle tarts, not a thing there but I wanted to eat one because it was his favorite dessert. And I made one and photographed it really poorly and wrote a little introduction that that was the inspiration and put it up online and then started doing a recipe a week. Within a couple of years, my blog moved on to The Guardian and I eventually ended up leaving theater so that I could spend time writing these books. So they are, in essence, trying to capture a moment in a novel when a character sits down and has something to eat trying to imagine what that might be like, what the best possible version of that food might be. And you're originally from Brisbane in Australia. What brought you to the UK? I had wanted to move since I was a small girl before I really knew what I wanted to do career-wise. But once I was at university and things felt a little bit more tangible, I knew that I still wanted to move here. It was very much about knowing that theatre was brilliant here. I was born here and then grew up in Australia and knew that I had the flexibility of a passport that let me come and work here for as long as I wanted. But also because my parents had lived here during the 80s, a sort of romanticism about going back and living in England that I think I had to satisfy. And so I bought a one-way ticket the day I graduated university. And you write in the little library year that you'd always been comfortable in the kitchen, but that it was only when you came to the UK that you felt you really became a cook? Essentially, I grew up cooking a lot with my mum. I grew up cooking a lot with my dad, with my grandma, with my granny. Lots of branches of my family were very enthusiastic cooks and still are. But I moved out of home for the first time when I came to England. I didn't move out of home to go to university. I went to university in the town where I'd grown up. So although I really enjoyed being in the kitchen, I never had to really think beyond just it's a special night, I'm going to cook something amazing and invite a bunch of my friends around. I suddenly had to plan and I had to think and I had to do all my own shopping and all of that sort of stuff that you learn for the first time when you move out of home. And that excited me far more than I had ever imagined that it would. And it took years, but it wasn't until I was here that I imagined that I could do more with cooking than just something I do at home. I now have a catering company with my business partner and we cater weddings and we do events and we do all sorts of things. We obviously haven't done any in the past year now. I think the last thing we did must have been we volunteered at Crisis over Christmas in 2019 and did dinners there. And that was the last thing we did before this all hit. And have you always been a reader? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I was very enthusiastic reader as a child. I'm very much a rereader as well. I have my favorites that I return to over and over. A comfortable proportion of my childhood was spent with books. I was very reluctant to do anything that made me go outside or do anything social if the alternative was being able to read. And it's lovely because in the books, which are as packed with literary references as they are 
recipes and cooking references. There's a lovely mix between childhood favourites and adult books. And I love that they're not, it's, it's not like a sense of a hierarchy. I think that's it. I don't see a hierarchy. I still lovingly read new children's literature. So obviously I reread old favourites and rediscover that. I spent the first couple of years of writing the first book, The Library Cookbook. I was a nanny while I was writing it. So I was rereading a lot of old favourites with the kids that I was nanny for. But I still read a lot of children's literature. I still engage with it as a genre. I read a lot of YA. I read pretty broadly and diversely. And I don't think that there is a hierarchy that we need to talk about or recognise. I think that's all valid stories to be told. Can we just describe these books for anyone who hasn't come across them? Because it maybe sounds a bit odd. Hang on a minute. Are (laughs) are they cookery books or are they reading guides or what? I guess they're kind of both. The subtitle for the second one, which is the one you have, the Little Library Year, is Recipes and Reading Throughout the Year. They are cookbooks. They are a list of 100 recipes that you might want to cook. They are very much the way that I cook. So it is a mix of recipes for lots of people and recipes for a very small number of people and a bunch of recipes when it's just you. I live on my own and that feels quite important to me to honour that and make sure that people who live on their own have lots of accessibility to really exciting things to cook when it's just them. And I want it to function as a cookbook. I want you to be able to open the book and find something you want to eat. I wasn't particularly interested in writing a version of this book that was really committed to getting every single detail right and being the version of that food that would have been eaten in 1860 or whatever it is. I'm not a food historian. There are lots of people who are who do this brilliantly. I am much more being inspired by and making the version that I want to eat in 2020. So I hope that first and foremost, the books function as cookbooks that people want to use and want to access. But also they do then come with reading recommendations and snippets of memoir and bits of writing about my life or about books or about seasons or whatever it is that has inspired that recipe. I have a brilliant publisher who really understand the books and want them to be exactly as I had envisioned them, which means that I get quite a lot of space to write essays and write text and prose which I think that lots of cookery writers aren't afforded. So I feel incredibly lucky that the books are sort of formatted in the way that they are to allow me to write loads about why you should read a particular book as well as why you should eat a particular biscuit. It is a really magical combination, I think. And I love the way that it feels like they sort of bounce off each other. You know, the book inspiration, then go into the recipe and then you go back to the book. There's this lovely correspondence. Often reading it, there's a sense of recognition. I know these books, or sometimes I don't actually, but often they're books that I know. But I haven't made that connection to thinking, oh, I could cook this thing. It felt almost like reading in 3D or experiencing (laughs) the books in a different way through the food, which is just That's really lovely. You will now always notice it. Oh, I certainly do. I cannot read a book without now really seeing in detail the meals and considering what it is I want to eat from them. (laughs) And they're really beautifully photographed. And I love the way sometimes there's like a little behind the scenes moment. (laughs) I love the one. It's like a bubble bath with a candle, a stack of books and a glass of whiskey. And I mean, that's just the dream, isn't it? (laughs) It's just like us. I mean, the photography is really special to me and really close to my heart because it's done by a friend of mine, Lane, who I went to university with. We both left the careers that we were in for food at around the same time. And she ended up going to photography. She lives in Australia. I live here. So we commit to two weeks or a week every time we do the photos for a book. And we live in the same place together and we cook 12 recipes a day and she'll photograph them and we invite people around to eat all the food. And it is quite an intense (laughs) time. She not only can take beautiful shots of food, but beautiful shots of landscape and spaces and the real life around the books. Yeah, it works really well. I'm actually not much of a cook. I'm a baker. I love to bake, Mm. but I don't have the same love for making savoury food. In fact, I really would just be so happy if I never have to cook anything. I love to (laughs) eat delicious food. I'm so thrilled if someone makes me some lovely food. I just couldn't be less interested in making it myself. You wouldn't know this if you came into my kitchen because it's stuffed with cookbooks because I really love 
to read cookbooks. That makes complete sense to me. I think if you're interested in people, which I am, and you like memoir and biography, I think a cookery book is actually another way of accessing what a person is like. Authors like Nigella Lawson, Nigel Slater, just really obvious ones that spring to mind because the second you read a line or two of their writing, the personality springs out. And I thought it's interesting. I felt like there was maybe a trend for that becoming slightly more overt. The idea of cookbook as memoir. I'm thinking of Midnight Chicken by Ella Risbridger which almost slightly flipped the idea so that it was primarily memoir, it felt like, and the recipes were then woven into that, which is really interesting and kind of very different way of reading a cookbook, but just a delight, a complete delight. But I felt like yours were almost like another note in that thread of the joy of reading cookbooks. Did you have any of that in mind? I really enjoy reading all of those books by people you've just mentioned. Ella's a really dear friend of mine, and we've talked a lot about how great it is to be able to write about food and to write about life. And Mm. that that intersection of real life and memoir and food makes total sense if you spend a lot of your day in the kitchen and really care about what it is that you're putting on a table and really care about what food says about the community you build and the space that you inhabit and all of those things. It does make sense to write about your life, but it is also something that is an incredible privilege as a recipe writer because so often you're not afforded an enormous amount of space in which to do that. Most recipe books are going to be restricted in terms of their space and are going to be restricted in terms of how much you're allowed to talk about your life while you're sharing recipes. And I think that there is a definite audience for food writing that is not just recipe writing. And that's not to privilege either one of those. I think it is to distinguish between books that are recipe books and books that are food books and that talk more generally about food. I have another friend who's a food writer, Olivia Potts, who wrote The Half-Baked Idea, which is very much a memoir about the death of her mum and then her transition from a career as a barrister into food. She's my business partner. That's how the story ends, essentially. It's also about her husband, but you know, it's about her and me too. Um, But it's about her discovering this love of food and discovering this connection in the kitchen and what that offers her and how much joy that brings. And that has... I think it's 16 chapters and a recipe at the end of each one. So it still includes some recipe writing, but it's very much a food book. It's a book about food. It's a book that tangibly has a sense of real appetite to it and a sense of taste to it. But it is very much a memoir that happens to have some recipes in it. And Ella very much straddles the line of memoir and cookbook in that it has a hundred recipes. It's very much a cookbook if you want to use it that way, but it's also a memoir and a piece of food writing if you want to read it that way. I think that it is wonderful to have the breadth of possibility that there is a market and an audience for people who want to read about life through food, but that there is also a huge amount of recipe writing for people who literally want to get dinner on the table at six o'clock and need an idea for it. It's so nice to hear about a half-baked idea. That's been on my TBR for a long time and I keep oh, circling it's around it. I didn't realise there was such a close connection. But yeah, no, yeah. I definitely thought, oh, it sounds like such a great story. I'm looking forward to reading that one. So you have, certainly in the one I've got, the Little Library Year, there is a sense of different sections that take you through the year. And then within that, you've picked up on different themes and you actually even have a little bit on lockdowns and apocalypses. <laughs> yeah, which feels very weird. <laughs> when I got to that, I was like, oh, did yeah. she know? That was a really weird one. So it's in the section on late October mm. where you just want to bed down and things are cold and dark again and it's not quite Christmas and there's food for the end of the world. And I was reading a lot of apocalyptic fiction, my favourite of which is Station Eleven. And my new favourite of which is actually The Stranding, which is coming out in June, which is amazing, which is about a woman who survives an apocalyptic event by hiding in the body of a whale that has beached itself in New Zealand and manages to survive and then thrive and build this new world. I love those sort of books when they have a real sense of the appetite and the hunger and how you have to think about what you're eating and where you're going to get it from. I don't quite trust books that don't have a real sense of where the food is coming from, particularly if they are adventure books or apocalypse books or books where, of course, it's going to be a massive question where that food is coming from. That's a huge part of everybody's day. If you are in a world where feeding yourself is difficult, 
it's going to take up a huge amount of your headspace. That is something that we all have to do every day. It would be like saying, oh, this world suddenly exists underwater, but we're not really going to deal with the question of how we breathe or anything. It's fine. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. How are you going to breathe? How are you going to eat? How are you going to do all of those basic things that your body needs to do to function? And so I find it fascinating in apocalyptic books, what the food is, what the language around food is, and also what the things that the people who remember the world before miss. There's a beautiful part in Station Eleven where a character has, I think it's an orange, and just thinks about oranges in the time before, because of course that's something that isn't really so accessible because the supply chain has shifted. It's not a massive explosion event. There will still be oranges in trees somewhere, but the way to get them to far North America isn't existing in the same way that it does right now in terms of our supply chains. And so the memory of all of those foods that we once had easy access to becomes a huge part of the story, which of course it does. It just feeds into all of those memories of the world before. Yeah, you mentioned Cormac McCarthy's The Road, which I think lockdown is so much worse for (laughs) those of us who've read The Road because we're also haunted by it. And in that, the apocalyptic event is such that the ground is covered with ash and it's not possible for people to grow food. So people are reliant on what they can scavenge. Well, it's the magic of finding that underground shelter with all the tins, you know, that moment in the road where it's, we haven't found stuff for so long. We've been living off terrible scraps. And then suddenly they find this underground bunker and there's what, tin pairs and, you know, all sorts of different things. I can remember that moment with all of that food. And in the road, I find utterly devastating yeah (laughs) and I finished the stranding and I hate sort of comparing books I really do I hate going oh it's not that it's you know and playing them off against each other because stories are valid in lots of different ways but the stranding made me feel the exact opposite to the way the road did where the road sort of filled me with this genuine sense of oh my god like if everything went and everything fell apart we'd all fall apart there'd be nothing left. The Stranding made me feel very hopeful for humanity and that we would find a way to make things good and to pull the light from the darkness. Well, and then there are people like you who helpfully provide us with these books that have recipes for things we can make out of tins. <laughs> well, so indeed. That... <laughs> Actually, tins and could... dried beans. <laughs> yeah, we could eat well. You've got this recipe for sardine, chili and breadcrumb pasta, which you say is one of your go-tos. Yeah, I've made that a lot this lockdown, I have to say. Yeah. You're right. When I was little, I only knew of tin sardines from Enid Blyton novels, in which they were inexplicably squashed onto slices of ginger cake and eaten at midnight feasts. Now I wouldn't be without them in my cupboard and employ them frequently in this supper, the work of moments an ideal for late arrivals home. There are weeks either busy or lazy where I end up eating it more than once. I love the reference to Enid Blyton there because I feel like Enid Blyton food in Enid Blyton books is always amazing. Like she writes brilliantly about food. Absolutely. And I think that that is something really magical generally about children's literature is how rich it is with food and detail of food. And I think there's a real sense of hunger on the page and sense of joy at being put at a table filled with food and there's so many scenes in children's books where it's like you've got a whole paragraph that's just listing all of the different things on the table I'm thinking of there's a tea party at the end of the little white horse where there's it must be sort of 15 16 guests and there's 24 plates of different types of cake and different types of sandwiches and different types of pastries on the table like more than they've got guests coming and it is just this extraordinary list and scene that is so visceral and so you can just see all of that detail there I don't know that one. Who is that by? It's Elizabeth Googe. It's lovely. It's from, I think, the 50s it was written, but it's set in a sort of magical 19th century. And so have you had a kind of go-to lockdown recipe? Was it the sardine pasta one? The sardine pasta I have done a lot. I've also done a lot of packet ramen noodles, but with loads of veg chucked in and miso through a broth, all poured in together with an egg. I've done that a lot. Um, Oh, that sounds nice. I have... I cook lots of stir fried greens every now and then I'll realize that yesterday I just had a tin of soup and some toast and an egg for breakfast and go, oh, there was nothing fresh there at all or green. And so I'll have a day of just going, okay, hold on, my body needs loads of green vegetables. How's reading been for you in lockdown? Have you made any new discoveries or have you been going back to old favorites? What books have you been turning to? 
I have read far more during this lockdown than I did last year. I think I was really easily distracted. Last year, I read a huge range of stuff. I read some things that I definitely will return to over and over again and have become favorites. But I also, for the first time in my life, really just, if I wasn't getting along with something, I just put it away. I've always been a bit of a completist. And so if I start something, I feel like I really should finish it. And I gave myself permission last year to be like, it's not the time. It's just not the time to push your way through a book that it's the wrong time for, where you might really enjoy it if you read it at a time you were more in the mood for it. But it's completely valid not to. You speak about this, don't you, in A Little Library Year, the idea of coming to books at the right time and that you tried Anna Karenina, put it down, it wasn't right, but then you came back to it and it was the right time. It was the right time, exactly that. And I've had that before, particularly with the season, with it feeling like the wrong time to read something like when it's a really hot day. But last year, it happened all the time. It wasn't the season, it wasn't the story, it wasn't anything. It was just, I cannot get purchase on anything here. And I'm judging this book in a way that I might not at any other point in my life. So I'm going to put it down and I will return to it post this time. But then there are books that I have really latched onto that are fantastic that I really enjoyed. I returned to The Song of Achilles, Madeline Miller, which I had read, I think must have been before I left theatre, so back in sort of 2014 or 15, and quite enjoyed then, but absolutely loved last year, just completely fell for. I really loved Brandon Taylor's Real Life. I really loved Mexican Gothic, which came out in the middle of last year. Really adore that and read it in, must have been two days and was just up. It is a Gothic novel and it has a real sense of horror about it. And I just kept waking up in the middle of the night thinking, okay, yep, uh, looking around my room, lights on, it's all fine, it's all fine. I'm still in this house on my own, it's fine, it's fine. Oh my goodness. Um, I also read Red, White and Royal Blue last year. April at the encouragement of my friend Ella, which is about a relationship between the first son of the United States and one of the princes of England who fall in love. And it is just the most charming story maybe in the world, maybe ever. And I read it twice last year. Who's that by? I've never heard of it. Casey McQuiston. And it's just so great. Genuinely so great. She's got another romance novel coming out middle of this year that all my friends are already looking forward to. But yeah, it's just such a charming, lovely story that made me very reassured. And also, it was quite a nice thing to read with all the Trump nonsense going on. I read it back in April, and then I read it again in those sort of weird four days after Biden had won the election, but before they'd counted everything before we knew that Biden had won the election. And it was such a bomb during that time to just read of an alternative 2020 where there was no coronavirus and also where the person who was president of the United States was a liberal woman whose ex-husband was a Mexican-American senator. It was really lovely. Oh, that sounds great. Have you ever been in a book club? I have not. And I really want to join one now, I think. I've done a lot of reading myself and a lot of my friends are really enthusiastic readers. So I have really long, in-depth conversations with friends about reading and about books. And I know a lot of people in book clubs. And so it's always felt slightly like, I just don't know the right one or the right group. I feel like it could be a really great thing for me. And so I have this thing that happens when I'm sure something's going to be exactly my thing and really great, where I just stand back for fear of making the wrong choice about the book club I'm going to get involved in and then don't end up in one at all. <laughs> so that, that sort of fear to commit because you know that it's going to be such a good thing if you get the right one. In the end, I just end up not committing. So that is part of my goal for 2021 is I really want to be in a book club. I don't know. I think you should be upfront about it and just announce that you're auditioning them and try each one in turn. <laughs> right. I'm coming to your book clubs. I will try one. Yeah, that's the really nice thing. I have a friend who's just joined a queer book club that's going to be happening on Zoom. And I was like, oh my God, that's my one. That's my one. I want to talk about queer books. I want to talk about queer books as a queer person. And that felt really exciting. And then they were full and now I'm on a waiting list. <laughs> so I'm on a waiting list for a book club. So it might happen at some point. <laughs> Well, you know, it must be good. And so of the many, many, many books that you've woven into your cookbooks, is there one that really is special to you that you'd want to push into people's hands? There's one that is in my first cookbook, that's in my second cookbook, 
that isn't in the Christmas one because it didn't quite fit, but it will be in everyone from now until forever, which is I Captured the Castle, oh. which is just my favourite book. <laughs> it's just a perfect story and it's beautiful and rich and I read it or a bit of it. I don't reread the whole thing. I know it too well by now. I don't need to reread the whole thing to be back in the story. You know, that feeling where you just go, I could open it at any chapter and I'm straight in. But I read a bit of it every year on my birthday. And it's such a perfect, extraordinary book. And in the first book, the recipe from it was for bread and butter, was for homemade butter. If you haven't read it, it's Dodie Smith, who also wrote The Hundred One Dalmatians, which because it was made into a Disney film, lots of people are more familiar with. But I Capture the Castle, I just think is a magical, magical story. It's perfect about sisters. It's perfect about first love. It's perfect about the complicated nature of family, not just about sisters, but about watching your parents and despairing at their life choices and trying to figure out what they're doing and trying to make the world work and trying to understand why people make the decisions they do. It's perfect on art and making art and the challenge of that and about desire and all sorts. It's a wonderful book. Yeah, that is such a great read. It begins, doesn't it? It's got a child narrator and she begins sitting in the kitchen sink. She's Yes, I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. And you're immediately like, what? Why are you in the sink? You're there. <laughs> you're hooked. <laughs> you're there, right? You're in their kitchen. I can picture that kitchen more easily than some of the ones I've lived in for years. You know, I know that kitchen. I know the bath. I know all of it. There was another one that you refer to in your book, which I thought, oh, yes, that would be a brilliant one for book club, which is Babette's Feast. Ah, such a joy. Also, tiny. People are going to love you in a book club because it's a tiny, tiny novella. And it's perfect because it is just, it's a meal. The whole story is that a woman leaves France as a refugee. She ends up living with a group of puritanical sisters who deprive themselves of lots of the tangible joy of food and drink, and they live quite simply. And then she wins the French lottery. She wins 10,000 francs in the French lottery, and she gets this money. And she was, it turns out, a chef back in Paris, this incredible chef who made this amazing food. And she decides to recreate this meal for these puritanical sisters and some of their closest companions. And she spends all of this money making this extraordinary feast that is like nothing they have ever eaten before. And when I turned 30, I made a very poor man's, I mean, it was delicious, but like there was no turtle soup. There was no ortolan because half the menu is now illegal. You can't eat it anyway. (laughs) But uh, I made a version of it, some of which ended up in the book. And my friends brought all the right wine. The wine's talked about in great detail. And all of my friends brought either the champagne or the sherry or whatever it was. And we ate the whole thing. And it was, yeah, 10 of us around a table. It was properly extraordinary. That is magical. It was made into a wonderful film, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Totally brilliant film. Like if you want to watch a foodie film, Babette's Feast is an extraordinary one. I would also highly, highly recommend Tampopo. It is billed as a ramen western instead of a spaghetti western. And it is a Japanese film about a woman who works in her late husband's ramen restaurant and makes very average ramen. And these two truckers arrive one day and go, we're going to help. And they sort of train her up in Rocky style scenes to be this incredible ramen chef and help her develop her restaurant. And interspersed with that story is just scenes, amazing, perfect little vignettes of just food scenes that happen in Japan. And it's such an extraordinary film. Oh, that sounds great. I love ramen. I can't think how I've come to miss that one. I feel like we've already had so many good book recommendations. I wonder if we could just end on one for a book club book. You know, the thing about good book club reads, I always think, is that they're not necessarily books that everyone just loves. Sometimes you want there to be something that people are going to pick up on and debate. Such a fun age. I feel like that is exactly the right kind of book. It's Kylie Reid. It was her debut. It's so brilliant, so sharp. And it's a book that starts with a scene where a nanny or a babysitter is at a supermarket really late at night with a child who is a white child. She is a black woman in America. And the security guard comes up to her and says, what are you doing here? This child is clearly not your child. Have you kidnapped this child? And you think that the story is going to go one specific way after that point. And it really doesn't. It gives you loads to talk about in terms of 
class, in terms of race, in terms of the relationship between people who work for you and work in your house and become part of your family, but also are never quite part of your family. And there's sort of conflict and challenge and slightly uncomfortable conversations that sit around that sort of relationship. I think it's so brilliantly done. It's also exactly the right sort of length for a book group. It's just over 200 pages. It's not an intense, chunky read. It's something that everybody will come having read all of and really wanting to talk about. Everybody I know who's read it wants to talk about it, which is great. I agree completely. It's just full of stuff to pick up on the debate. Yeah. And also, it's just a really brilliant page-turning read. So, Isn't it? Uh, it's me. so thrilling. It's just like you want to keep knowing what's happening. The characters are so compelling. You're so instantly, like that first scene is so good. You are so instantly in that story with those people. But then all of the expectations and all of your assumptions about those characters shift and change as the book happens and unfolds. And there's so much more to that situation than there even appears at the beginning. Yeah. Great recommendation. Thank you. Well, Kate, it's been so lovely to talk to you. Thanks for spending the time. Thank you. There's a lovely quote from Diana Henry on the cover of The Little Library Year that I just wanted to read. She says, recipes you long to cook, suggestions for books you want to read, a sense of place and season and tales of a life lived thoughtfully and well. This is a very special book written with great generosity. I think that's true. That's what I felt when I read it. I just thought, oh, wow, this is such a generous book. It's like It's a a very generous quote from her as well. It's really lovely. No, I think it sums it up perfectly. And I hope that many more readers and food lovers discover them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. That's almost it for this episode. Books mentioned were Midnight Chicken by Ella Risbridger, A Half-Baked Idea by Olivia Potts, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, The Stranding by Kate Sawyer, The Road by Cormac McCarthy, The Little White Horse by Elizabeth Googe, Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, Real Life by Brandon Taylor, Mexican Gothic by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, Red, White and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston, I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith, Babette's Feast by Isaac Dennison, and Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid. We'll also put all those in the show notes. And you can find all the details about Kate, her books and her recipes at her website, thelittlelibrarycafe.com. Our next book club discussion will be on The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffe, a vividly told love story set in the Caribbean. A fishy tale of doomed womanhood. It was the surprise winner of the UK's Costa Book of the Year Award. But what did my book club make of it? Listen in to find out. If you enjoyed this show, check out our website where you can find our archive of over 80 shows to browse through, including our most recent episode on Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. We've also covered everything from mega hits like Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens and Normal People by Sally Rooney, to hidden gems from the backlist like All Passion Spent by Vita Sackville West. You can also explore our library of book reviews and articles, and find our weekly roundups of reading inspiration under What to Read. We're also launching a newsletter. Check our website for details of how to sign up. You can also follow us for daily book reviews and recommendations on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate and review the show and help other listeners find us. But for now, that's our show. Thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>